drugs can be wonderful things, curing disease, relieving pain, or even helping us lose weight. But taken for the wrong reason or no reason, they can become a terrible monster that takes control of our lives and pushes us into the abyss. We investigate drug abuse and addiction. The doctors are on call tonight. Funding for On Call Television is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Dermatology, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, the Orthopedic Institute, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Welcome to On Call Television. There may be no more solemn issue to be wary of and no more difficult to cure illnesses than drug abuse and addiction. The consequences of addictions affect our physical and mental states, our social lives and the people closest to us who receive firsthand the profound impacts of drug and addictions. According to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health reports, marijuana ranks first in the nation, followed by prescription drugs as the most common form of drug abuse. That trend runs true for South Dakota's youth as well. The Office of Adolescent Health reports that 33% of middle school and high school students have used marijuana. What can be done to combat drug abuse and how can we deal with the wide range of addictions? How can we protect our vulnerable youth assist those who fall into the shadow of addiction, whatever the source, and where can we work to reduce the stress on our social institutions, including our expensive prisons caused by what is essentially a mental disease. Here to help us answer questions tonight on drug abuse and addiction are an adult psychiatrist and a child psychiatrist. Let's meet them. Hi, I'm Matt Stanley. I'm a board certified psychiatrist in uh, adult psychiatry. I also have an additional accreditation in uh, addictions through the American Board of Addiction Medicine. I'm a graduate of South Dakota State University, did my medical school at the University of Osteopathic Medicine in Des Moines, and residencies at UMKC and USD. I'm currently the medical director for Avera McKinnon Behavioral Health, as well as Avera Marshall Behavioral Health. Hi, I'm Dr. David Ermer. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I did my undergraduate and medical school training at the University of Nebraska. I did my general psychiatry and child fellowship at the University of Kansas. I'm currently employed by Sanford Health in Sioux Falls, but I also work with uh, Children's Home Society, Children's Care Hospital and School, and Southeastern Behavioral Health. Well, this show is all about your questions. You make it interesting and when the questions come in fast and furious it's hard to get them all answered so call or email early please we'll go where you want and we'll do our best to respond please call your questions comments about drug abuse and addiction call 1-888-376-6225 you may also submit them at oncalltelevision.com and click on the questions button so we're talking about addictions. Now both of you, uh, and I love the fact that we have both sides of the, the green and the red here from uh, Sioux Falls. Uh, it shows that we, we do all get along. The doctors uh, interact all the time. Uh, but um, 
Uh, let's start with you, Matt. Your your experience with addictions. I mean, you've had special uh, uh, boarding in in addictions medicine. How much of what mental health has to do with addiction problems? Well, that's a great question, Rick, and it probably depends on which perspective you take. If we take uh, those that we define or used to define as mentally ill. We talk about co-occurring disorders now, so the mentally ill might be major depression along with an alcohol dependence or an amphetamine abuse. And estimates run as high as 60% of co-occurring disorder. In other words, if you have a primary psychiatric illness, you'll also very likely have uh, an addiction as well. If you look at the other side of the spectrum, looking at addiction as the primary illness, again, we have a very high rate of co-occurring disorders. Most of my practice has been in um, acute uh, psychiatric hospital care and so uh, you know throughout my career of about 18 years um, it's been something we've dealt with throughout that time in 18 years things have changed quite a bit in terms of how we conceptualize it and also I think more so in the last four or five years how we treat it I think we're looking at uh, the medical model is taking is gaining greater traction the medical model meaning that is there's a medical genetic uh, deficiency of a certain hormone in there or a neurotransmitter and therefore you have this uh, illness. Right. I think, as I said, both how we conceptualize it. So, you know, I won't pretend to have all the answers to addiction, but I think the there was a fault when we believed it was only, you know, the weak-willed, the uh, unmotivated. We now know that uh, other factors such as genetics, environment, <clears throat> um, exposure all have impacts. The other side of that equation is too, now that we're beginning to understand at the neurotransmitter level, at the cellular level of receptors, we are beginning to come up with strategies to help uh, impact outcomes. In other words, medications that may help to deal with addictions. Okay. And David, as a child psychiatrist, you, you see uh, kids probably not generally addicted when they're very young. But you're seeing them as they get older uh, go into it. Right. We see certainly substance abuse problems in the young. And uh, we know, um, you know, studies have shown that the earlier onset of drug use predisposes to, you know, more problems. So I think there's a huge prevention and um, potential if we target the young people and try to catch them before it becomes a problem into adulthood. Well, the forbidden fruit kind of a thing is what, what drives some people into it, I, I would wonder. You know, this is not allowed, therefore I need to try it, and oh, it's available, so they do. Oh, absolutely. I think there's no question that some people view adolescent substance abuse as a developmental issue. They want to engage in risk-taking behaviors, they want to be independent, they want to be accepted by their peers. There's gen a general misperception that their use is greater than they think it is. And believe it or not, even though you know alcohol and drug use is common in high school, others think that everyone's doing it and they're the only ones who aren't. And so there's these misperceptions, and so they want to they want to take risks. You know, and there's certainly brain research that shows that adolescents are more more vulnerable to these uh, issues. Well, the worry you have is that these uh, attempts, you know, of risk taking, can be harmful to them. How how much data do we have to say that? Uh, uh, those drugs are any harm to, to, to people? That's the question I have. Right, and I, th I think there's a real concern because we know now that the brain continues to develop into the early 20s. And there's real concern that, you know, drugs that were, you know, that I think a lot of adolescents view as harmless experimentation can really impact the developing brain. We don't have all the answers yet. We do know that marijuana, for instance, can have a negative impact on development and even some concern that if you're predisposed to like a major psychiatric illness such as schizophrenia, using marijuana during adolescence can actually uh, sort of push you over into developing schizophrenia, whereas if you had never used marijuana, you would never develop that major mental illness. That's an interesting genetic study because there's three different um, genetic uh, sets of alleles you can have in, in regard to a transporter. And so it's a little so bit. Alleles and transporter. It's it's just the it's the genes you're handed through uh, procreation and and you don't know what you have unless you're studied. So um, and you've got all these sets of genes. You don't. They're sitting there quietly, right. not being used. Right. And we can start to look at those. But let's say if each of us represented those three different type of of transporters. So the transporter is what moves uh, a chemical into the cell. So let's say we've all got the different types. Your risk, if you smoke marijuana, of having a psychotic event is um, very low. 
David's, Dr. Ermer's, is... Um, genetically, we're saying, for example. Right, genetically. His is about twofold. Mine, if I'm loaded uh, at the, with, with the worst possible alleles, is uh, on the order of uh, six or seven times more likely to have a psychotic event due to the marijuana. And then, as, the, as Dr. Ermer said, the... Once you've gone there. Once comes. you've gone there, you can't go back, and then it, and it pulls the start of the psychosis much younger, and, and younger also equals more severe. So, so it is the idea that um, it's a little bit of Russian roulette. So some of the concepts that are disturbing in the young is the concept that these are harmless drugs. When, if you look at the NIDA website, and I encourage people to look at that. What is the NIDA? National Institute of Drug Abuse. And they do track use among um, children and adolescents. The strongest predictor of whether use will go up or down is the perceived risk of the drug. So as we, through media or legalizing dr drugs, et cetera, appear as a society to say these drugs are less risky, use skyrockets. When I think that it holds to with marijuana now with the legalization in certain, you know, in Colorado for recreational use. In fact, when I've, I've interviewed a young man, I said, you know, he was in for substance abuse and other reasons. I said, well, do your parents use drugs? No, no, they just smoke marijuana. And, and that's that perception that is, you know, it's gotten to the point where they don't even think it's a drug. I've run across that so many times during the initial interview. Do you use any drugs? No. Well, I smoke marijuana every day, yeah. but I don't use drugs. <laughs> so it's a, maybe a definitional issue there as well, right. but certainly a, So it's a concern. It is a concern. Well, I mean, certainly, uh, there is some data to suggest that, that repeated use of marijuana over a long period of time, you're losing function. You're losing Absolutely. capacity to so explain that. Well, I think there's some amotivational issues. There's, a, again, I'm concerned that your reward center that we had discussed, you, you know, you get this feeling on the marijuana, then all of a sudden you can no longer recreate that feeling. So just general sort of living no longer creates pleasurable uh, responses in you, so you have you, you get this sort of a motivation, this lack of pleasure in life with any of the drugs, and so it's real concerning. It's a very hard thing to study because, you know, you, you can only catch people, um, we just don't know the answers. I think anytime you're dealing with the developing brain, anytime you introduce any foreign uh, drug, you're really concerned that you're really changing the long-term impact on emotional and cognitive functioning. We're going to talk about how to so I don't think it's the marijuana smokers, uh, the, the grandchildren that are watching. It's these grandparents and parents who are watching going, oh my gosh, now how do I help encourage my kid not to do this? We need to talk about that a little bit next. But first this, in, in order to combat the misuse and abuse of prescription, prescription drugs, the, the narcotics, the prescriptions that we prof pr uh, provide, we need to know who is being prescribed what, by whom, and how often. To meet this challenge, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, or PDMP, was implemented by 49 states, including the state of South Dakota. It's a great step in the right direction. A doctor shopper is really someone who is either abusing controlled substances on their own or um, selling them, and oftentimes go to different doctors in an area or throughout a state or even throughout the country and get prescriptions for controlled substances and fill them at different pharmacies so that people aren't tracking um, that kind of behavior. The South Dakota Prescription Drug Monitoring Program began in, in 2010 and is, um, has been operational since March of 2012. It's basically a data repository where all pharmacies submit all controlled substance prescriptions to the monitoring um, database. It was founded and it was passed into law because of the fact that prescription drug overdoses had become quite a problem in the country nationwide and it was South Dakota's way to um, assist in that problem. We look at people who have used six doctors and six pharmacies in a 90-day period, and those people are um, called out. We're just beginning to send letters to doctors and um, pharmacies on those people that they have served who meet that threshold. Law enforcement became aware of a group of individuals from Florida. Um, this happened because of a very astute pharmacist who questioned an individual who had come into the pharmacy 
um, picking up narcotic prescriptions for uh, two different people, um, different names of people. So um, they were made aware of it, started looking. It's um, become a, a ring of, um, it's now a conspiracy case. It's, um, we don't have much to do with it outside of providing law enforcement with the information on all the individuals from Florida who were here getting prescriptions. But it's also a good program to help with patient care. We've seen it both ways where doctors have used it to make sure people are actually filling their prescriptions. Um, and they realize that they're not, um, they're compl still complaining of pain. And one doctor called in uh, to the office here and said, you know, thanks for this program. I found my patient wasn't filling her prescriptions and she was still complaining of pain. So it, you know, it can be used in, in other ways. Please call in your questions, comments about drug abuse or addiction. Call 1-888-376-6225. Thank you for those who've called. We may also submit, you can also submit them on oncalltelevision.com by clicking the questions button. Uh, let's talk about self-medication. Uh, someone called from Sioux Falls to find self-medication and why is it dangerous? Well, it's a tricky definition, and um, uh, I understand, I think I understand what the caller's talking about. So we talk about, give you an example, uh, people with bipolar disorder, and they will say, you know, I use alcohol because otherwise I can't sleep, I'm too manic, my brain is racing. Um, so you can extend that concept to other things. I have great anxiety, I use marijuana because I'm self-medicating my anxiety. So I understand what the principle and the concern, I would just encourage those folks to actually see uh, a medical specialist and make sure that, um, you know, it's interesting, talk about anxiety and panic. Classic study with, uh, with panic is to use THC, the active uh, uh, part of the cannabis, to induce panic disorders. That's how it's often studied. So sometimes what you're using has unrecognized repercussions. Um, but I'm very cautious about that because one of the things the addicted brain does very well is learns to rationalize use. I'm not accusing anyone that's called in of doing that or anyone who describes self-medication. But one of the things that's hard in addictions is to just be brutally self-honest about use and behavior. And so I have run across that as well, folks with addiction that justify their use through the term self-medication. Yeah. Well, you know, I agree. I do see adolescent, especially like social anxiety, uh, the person who's afraid to speak up, they feel like they can't socialize at a party until Unless they have a drunk. couple. Yeah, exactly, and I do see that. But I, you know, it's it's one of the theories of addiction. But I think there's, you know, like Dr. Stanley said, there's, you know, it's it's sometimes hard to sort out which came first. We know that um, in depression, for instance, um, a lot of studies show that depression are, precedes alcohol use by two years. So in other words, we're missing the depression in the adolescents. If we'd be actively treating that through either counseling or even medication management, maybe we'd never get to the point of using alcohol. So uh, everybody, we're talking about drug abuse, and we're talking about self-medicating with drugs that uh, that's, that are out there, or even alcohol and marijuana is self-medicating. But uh, there are people who say that uh, that uh, the SSRIs, the antidepressants, uh, they're also abusable, or that they're also harmful. I mean, there's fear about them. Tell me how uh, you know, particularly with children. Right. What I, relieve me of that anxiety? Well, no, I, I do think that um, we need to use SSRIs judiciously in children and adolescents, but they aren't addicting. Carefully. Addic carefully, right. They're not addicting. In fact, you know, people worry about the side effects of these medications in adolescents, but there's also tremendous side effects for by, you know, untreated anxiety, untreated depression, leading to school failure, leading to other problems. And so I, you do a risk-benefit analysis before starting the medicine. Yeah. And I think the SSRIs are really one of our best anti-anxiety drugs, not the Valium. Like Absolutely. They are. They're they the are. first choice in adolescence. First choice. And although, right, although we term them antidepressants, they're as effective in most anxiety disorders. The concept of addiction involves things like tolerance and craving, and those are a couple of things you won't see in an SSRI. In other words, 
we talk about in the addiction cycle, there's first the impulsive use and it becomes compulsive. It goes from positive reinforcement to negative. In other words, when I can no longer have my drug, now I crave it, now I desire it. Now my entire thought process is about getting more of it and my body goes through a physical withdrawal. It's a very different physiologic response to those drugs that you become addicted to. Right. I think we SSRI we're talking things like Prozac, Zoloft, and you know, uh, right. sertraline or yeah. things that you may feel worse, but your body doesn't go through a withdrawal process. You don't go through a no. craving. You don't become preoccupied with obtaining. Those are concepts of addiction. I, I think the SSRIs, and of course they have. We need to use them judiciously, carefully. But I think they're one of the great advances in in uh, pharma, ph pharmacology over my lifetime. Uh, that w w this, as we're talking about it, this question uh, from Yankton is addictive personality related to borderline personality. Please expand on borderline personality. Well, that's you know, there's you know, even the term addictive personality is somewhat um, controversial. controversial because there's you know, the, you're assuming that somebody is going to start an activity and not be able to stop, and that's not necessarily true. The people who are, have substance abuse issues may be fine in other aspects of their life. So, the whole concept of addictive personality is probably it's, it's yeah I think it's a misnomer I, I think it's probably a misnomer I think there are people that have through genetic loading and environment higher risk of becoming addicted to things but I don't know that they they look at the entire world and everything they're at risk to be addictive so and personality disorders in general are, are an ingrained uh, way of responding to your environment borderline personality disorder has specific uh, aspects of that that we, we probably won't that that would be a couple of shows in itself Rick but um, you know I mean define it as they really have trouble in their environment particularly with interpersonal interactions and they tend to trigger intense emotional responses um, very brief synopsis of that so as you can as we talk about things like self-medicating these are also folks that are tend to overreact in terms of using substances um, not everyone so again don't want to generalize addiction and borderline are not co-occurring in every single case, but there is a risk there. So let's, uh, probably uh, uh, the prescribed drugs, the most commonly prescribed drug that's abused is uh, hydrocodone or the narcotics with some Tylenol. The second most is Ambien, which is a Valium-like sleeping medicine. We talked a little bit about that. So um, let's talk, uh, we'll talk about narcotics in a bit, but let's talk about Ambien, Valium, sleeping medicines, that are based on benzodiazepine. Where are you at with those? Well, they're addicting, and that's why, in my opinion, they're not the first line choice for adolescents at all. In fact, I'm very cautious about even using them. I think for like acute stress reactions, let's say there's a death in the family, you might use it short term, but I, at least in adolescents, not a big fan of any long term use of the benzodiazepines. I absolutely loathe them because they're extremely habituative or addictive, and you, and, uh, and it makes them, they, people get depressed on Absolutely. them. If you Cognitive slowing. If you deal with older people, they get uh, demented from them. I think, and not to parse uh, words and, and focus on semantics, but there, when we talk about addiction and dependence, there is an important difference from a physiological. Now, I don't argue that benzodiazepines, of which we're talking like the Xanaxes and the Valiums, can't cause addiction. They're more likely to cause dependence, and they're somewhat related to half-life. And so those are things that we in the medical community talk about to our viewers. You know, half-life is how long a drug lasts and how, how, how long you feel um, elevated on it. So short half-life drugs, Xanax, which is one of um, the favorite prescribed drugs, has a very short half-life. Put you on a roller coaster, that's a recipe for Trouble. addiction, craving, and, you know, use. Whereas you look at some of the others, clonazepam, which was originally developed as an anti-epileptic, much less of that roller coaster. You have overlapping half-lives. Dependence, certainly. Addiction, maybe less so. But again, I, I wouldn't argue that to too fine a point. Ambien and the so-called um, Z drugs, the sleepers, when they went through the FDA... Z drugs. Z yeah. Sleep. When they Got went it. through the FDA studies, they allegedly um, do not cause um, addiction but they have a myriad of problems. Ambien, one of the biggest things that people aren't aware of is the amnestic syndrome. And one of the most common ones is nighttime eating. You'll talk to patients who say, I wake up and there's breadcrumbs in my bed and I don't remember <laughs> getting up, or my kitchen is a mess, you know, and who so. Who did that? Yeah, so there are issues with all these drugs and probably the bottom line is um, be cautious with anything that affects your, 
your yeah. internal state. The only sleeper I prescribe is trazodone or, or um, uh, mirtazapine. I'll tell you are, one of the most, well, yeah, mirtazapine, which is actually a fairly good antidepressant. Yeah. One of the most popular ones is Tylenol PM, not to say a brand name, but it's pure, it's Benadryl, diphenhydramine. Um, probably one of the easiest drugs to use. Still has cognitive effects in the elderly and other issues, but. It's, a, it's on the beers list that don't use it in the elderly. Yeah. Right. Uh, there's really no good sleeper if you're uh, in that elderly stage, yeah. or certainly if you have the onset of dementia. Sometimes melatonin's not, you know, not, so bad. not so bad. It's not so bad. It, one of the misconceptions, I think, about melatonin is that you generally have to take it over time. It's not as good for a PRN. Yeah. In other words, at one dose, I need to sleep tonight, I'm taking melatonin. Yeah. Right, not we don't have good sleepers. Trazodone is is what yeah. I'd say. Get off of Ambien if you're on it. It's bad, bad. Um, <laughs> which type of antidepressant is most addicting, or and antipsychotics or tricyclics? No, and which ones should you stay away from? Class one, class two. So, no antidepressants are addicting. They're not addicting. The Valiums By are not an antidepressant. No. No, Xanax has a very small, in its product information, talks about some impact on depression, never used for an antidepressant. It is an anti-anxiolytic. I think what, uh, and again, it may be semantics to some folks, it's an important distinction for us. There are antidepressants that are abused, particularly in prison systems and other places where other more desirable drugs aren't used. Like um, what? Uh, well, Butrin can be. So, and there's maybe a few others. Understand for our viewers that is a difference though between ability to abuse and ability to become dependent and addicted to. Okay, I didn't know about uh, bupropion or Wellbutrin. Baby born to parents who were both doing marijuana at conception, is the baby more prone to become addicted? Are there other effects? We don't know for sure. We know more about fetal alcohol syndrome and, we, and we're just learning about other things like amphetamines during pregnancy. We're not sure exactly what the outcome is there's not an identifiable syndrome, so we just don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Just but looking at a study today that talked about cocaine using mothers, smaller brain mass in their children. We know about nicotine. We haven't talked about that. One of the most addictive drugs on the face of the earth. Right. One of the most abused. And we know that results in things like lower birth weight. Maybe ADHD. So, so there are really? impacts. From cigarette smoking. Wow. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Um, we don't, you know, I think the studies haven't been, you know, we don't know there's a major syndrome like fetal alcohol syndrome with marijuana use, but, you, you know, we just don't know how to detect. There's so many other variables. Typically, parents who smoke marijuana during pregnancy probably aren't, you know, if the child's living with the parents, there's, there's environmental issues with having, um, you know, intoxicated parents every day. There's, there's yeah. all kinds of other factors. It's hard to sort out. Yeah. Difficult to isolate one variable when the environment is probably not optimal. Yeah, and then you always worry about epigenics. Epigenics meaning uh, that uh, it doesn't mean that it has to be handed down. It's sort of like obesity uh, in a grandparent will rub off on the grandchild. Uh, we don't know what's happening with epigenics and any drug. No. We just don't know. It probably are. They probably, and the drugs are probably turning on some genes that you're passing down. We just don't know what they are yet. Right. It's kind of a scary unknown. People are very careful about other aspects of their lives, you know, like they're watching their diet, but they're, they seem to be a little bit more cavalier sometimes about the drugs, and, and they're, they're more worrisome. Yeah. Teen Challenge of the Dakotas in Brookings, South Dakota, is a program that works intensely with young male adults who face addictions. It transforms them back to law-abiding, responsible citizens and guides them to learn ways in which to help themselves. Well, the name Teen Challenge is a little misleading in terms of uh, identifying the, the, the students that are here because we deal with men 18 years and older. It just kind of, over the past 50 plus years, it evolved to whereas there are a lot more adult centers than teen centers. Addiction is just one malfunction uh, of a life that's damaged or in pain. So we just go further than the, the regular treatment option for, for addiction and we really just treat the whole person by dealing with the whole person and helping them discover why they're, they're hurting so much and why they would be so self-destructive and going to the root, if you will, uh, we think that's the big key to having these guys be set free, if, you know, uh, in terms of uh, having a stable future and just a happy life. Usually we work a lot with the unified judicial system throughout the, the state of South Dakota, so we have a lot of judges. Uh, a lot of public defenders, a lot of probation officers who already know of us and use our program, rather than send a young man 
who has a lot of uh, drug offenses and maybe some crime in, intermittent with that activity, rather than send him to the pen, we offer this 16-month program uh, to, to help redirect that life. It consists of 10 months here in this brand new facility, the main training facility where the, all the uh, discipline and training uh, at the most intense level takes place. Then they segue to the, to the downtown location for another six months, and that's a re-entry phase, a transitional phase, almost like a halfway house. So the men there are getting full-time jobs in the community. They're working on a financial budget. We're helping men to discover their inner pain, uh, their, their bitterness of soul, and give them, give them the ability to see that he can prosper instead of expecting that he'll just fail all over again. I was severely addicted to drugs, uh, me uh, methamphetamine, and just over-the-counter cough medicine. And my wrestling coach had actually gone through here about 10 years earlier and my mom got him to talk to me and I, he, he pretty much told me there's no way you're gonna quit unless you have some something else that you can rely on you can't do it yourself went to stay with another relative and uh, and this friend would always be calling me like oh hey let's go brew up a batch or whatever I'd be like no I'm not doing that anymore it's I'm pretty much dead and uh, I'm, I'm thinking about going to Teen Challenge, and I come to find out the day I got here, December 5th, he got arrested for uh, manufacturing. So I'd, I'd be in prison right now if I hadn't died. I believe it's more of a choice. It's, it comes down to deep down, if you want to change, you're, then you can change. But there's definitely, you have to go through something to get here and actually want to change. Oof. I, uh, well, I can tell you as a person who has worked with Teen Challenge these many years, what a fabulous service it is for the people there and uh, people who uh, would have been dead uh, came alive again. And uh, many of those are, I, I see it as a male mentoring experience because I think men in particular raised without a male example uh, are the ones that, uh, you know, who have a lot of problem with the heavy things like the methamphetamine experience and so on and so forth. Let's talk about methamphetamine. There is a, that and cocaine and excessive amphetamine abuse and so on and so forth, those are big time. Uh, brain destroyers. Let's talk about it. Well, you, I mean, you mentioned it. They, um, they can induce a lot of um, psychiatric symptoms. We see people coming in after meth abuse. They're psychotic. You know, they, they don't, they're suffering from paranoid delusions, auditory and visual hallucinations. The problem that we see with meth is, first of all, you don't know what went into it. You don't know how potent it is. And those people don't always come back. In other words, there isn't full recovery. And I think until you've seen that. Come back, you mean that you I mean, they remain them, psychotic. They, and I mean, they remain months psychotic. and on medications that would normally block those psychotic episodes, they are not coming back and may never come back. And if you've seen that once, I would think it would scare you straight or it would certainly make you think, think very strongly about it. But meth is, it is our, probably our most difficult issue in terms of psychiatric comorbidity in, in the Midwest. Right. Yeah. I think the other, th coming back, I see people coming down off the meth and they get, they crash, they get depressed. I mean, they're dysphoric. And, and you ask yourself, how long do you wait before you say it's a major, dep I mean, they, they look like they have major depression and yeah. we think it's probably chemically induced. How long does it, you know, we don't know how long that lasts. Is it forever in some people? And is it amenable to antidepressants yeah. as a, you know, maybe a genetic major depression? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, they, they are the, those who say that uh, the methamphetamine high is borrowing from the future joys that you would have had tomorrow and the next day and you'd use them all up and there's no joy left. Well, there, and there's absolute truth in that in almost every addiction. The body is created to maintain homeostasis. In other words, to create a balance. balance. So when you put an endogenous substance in that's very powerful, it, an exogenous, it shuts down the endogenous or your internal ability to develop things. We're talking about primarily dopamine, one of the main neurotransmitters of joy and interest and attention. 
that methamphetamine will mimic. It will hit the other uh, receptors and give you this high. Well, when you're getting it from an outside source, your internal sources start to shut, shut down. down. Receptors, instead of being a normal, you know, they change. So even when you start to produce, now your receptors are abnormal. So that idea that, again, we go back to um, addiction isn't just lifestyle choices. You're changing brain chemistry and, and your your ability to operate normally in the world. And that's what I'm saying, you know, these dopamine um, typically is what creates psychosis. Now you've jacked this dopamine up, you've got psychotic episodes, and we can't necessarily reset that chemistry even with our knowledge and the medications that we have available. Even with abstinence, sometimes you've made permanent changes in your brain, and that's scary. And you know, I, I met a young lady, and um, crack cocaine is very similar to meth. It's the same dopamine. And she said, "You." And she said, "You wouldn't." I tried crack with her boyfriend once. You know, bad choices in life. She goes, "You couldn't believe how good I felt, and then how quickly that feeling went away, and how the only thing I could think of is I want to feel that good again." And she said, "It's you know, it scared the heck out of her." And said, "I." And she had enough. I don't know if you call it self-control to say, "I can't do this anymore because it'll become a problem." And it, and it takes how many times? Well, it's sometimes once, and that's what's frightening. People think, I, <laughs> can, time, I, can, I can do this, I can do this for a lark. I'll just do it once. Not necessarily. <laughs> that's just awful. Well, you guys have watched uh, Breaking Bad. Have you seen that show? I've heard about it. Okay. Yeah, and you, you. My wife, if she's watching, is a big <laughs> fan. So, yeah. All I, I can I, say I, is I've, I, we've been watching it from, uh, from, uh, you know, from uh, Netflix kind mm -hmm. of a thing. So it, we were watching first season. Now we're into the second season. Well, it's a guy who, a chemistry teacher who's making methamphetamine. Well, you can see the people that he's dealing with. I mean, it's scary. I mean, these are, these are big time criminals. Yeah. And it's uh, enough on that. Uh, here's from Spearfish. Can alcohol use, uh, use cause hallucinations? Usually on the withdrawal process. And um, so we call, you know, you've heard of DTs, delirium tremens. Right. That's the most common. There is, a, there is a subset called alcoholic hallucinosis. It's relatively rare. So yes, it can, um, but not usually during the intoxicated phase. Uh, and DTs, just to point out, besides just hallucinations, DTs can be deadly. I mean, you can yeah, die, from, die from them. People die from them. Yes. Yeah, 10% mortality if untreated wow. in a medical. So, uh, and, uh, I don't know what they're looking at. Is there a relative that has had hallucinations, or these, uh, you know, there are other causes of hallucinations. I mean, just right. without right. drugs, people can have hallucinations. We're seeing them. We're, we were discussing at the break um, the synthetic marijuanas, whatever that means, because it's probably a whole group of stuff yeah. somebody's making up. Yeah. We've seen some. I've seen some adolescents use uh, this synthetic marijuana and really be out of touch with reality for months. And the medicines again don't seem to help. Yeah. The medicines we use for psychosis don't seem to help, and it's a very scary situation. Yeah. yeah, this is the K2, which is sold in, you know, head shops, herbal stores. And you would think, because it's sold over the counter and people think marijuana is safe, oh, this has got to be even safer. We've seen some horrible cases of psychosis that doesn't resolve. Psychosis? Or doesn't resolve easily, even with medications, again, over several weeks, if not months. And these are generally it's teenagers that are involved with this artificial marijuana. And yes. then, then there's the bath salts too, which are what, another. Well, yeah, form what of, is bath salts? A little more like a, um, more on the order of some Ex of this ecstasy. Yeah, the synthetic of, stimulant kind of. Again, but again, the, you don't know. I mean, you're going to a yeah. drug dealer and trusting they're going to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. And you're and the, yeah. it's it's made in a house or something, and, and it's yeah. just a scary proposition all so, around. So uh, and and what so what is ecstasy? What, is that kind of a that's also the same thing? You don't yeah. know, but it's it is a little bit of a of a speed, kind of a, a amphetamine like? Yeah, most of these are operating on some um, dopamine related uh, excitatory circuit and... Um, There's a receptor group called the NMDA receptor group, it, not to get too technical, that kind of operates on, but it, again it creates euphoria, a general feeling of well-being. And uh, the ecstasy is, is relatively dangerous or... You know, th you know, there's been deaths. You know, they're just. I think they shut down a music festival in New York this uh, summer with people using something similar to ecstasy because people don't realize they get dehydrated and they die. And they're, you know, they're dancing at these raves all night, so it can be very dangerous. What, what's Molly? Is that something like that? I think. You know, I'm not. An, I, I think it's very similar to ecstasy, is what I've read. But I certainly. You know, one of the things when we see the um, the 40 year old male with sudden onset of cardiac arrest, and this isn't speaking of anyone who, I hope I don't offend any family members, but one of the first thoughts is cocaine. You get that, yeah. you get that cardiac spasm, the, 
and coronary disease yeah, and cocaine. Yes, almost imminent, you know, those death and otherwise healthy individuals. Yeah, we've seen 20 year olds, you know, coming through the ER where I worked in Kansas City, and again, between cocaine and crack, and you show them the EKG, you've already looked like a, an 80 year old man with your EKG, because you have evidence of prior heart, <laughs> you know, prior heart attacks, and you're, yeah. you're 27 years old. Oh, um, well, and you see, the aging process occur in these people. I mean, the mouths of the of the meth, uh, methamphetamine users. Here's a question that's kind of off the, the, the different, and that is, what's your opinion of buspar? Buspar or uh, bupropion mm -hmm. bup uh, uh, is a uh, anti-anxiety drug that is not quite like Valium, and there, but it, you can't replace the benzodiazepine Valium Ativan Xanax with Buspar because they're not satisfied with it. I think it's Buspirone. And Buspirone, it Buspirone, that's what it is. Yeah, so, um, well, it, it, I mean, FDA, it past FDA studies showed that it was better than placebo in treating anxiety. What I would tell you is, I think one of the main reasons it isn't more effective in general use is if you've been exposed to benzodiazepines, you're probably not gonna feel like the Buspar is doing what yeah. it should. If if you are benzodiazepine naive and have never been, you've It'll then work. it has a much higher likelihood of being effective Habituative for you. or addictive? No, no I, I mean, I think it's a better choice in terms of that safety profile. Okay. Working to deal with addictions is neither easy nor cheap. There are a few pioneering doctors who are looking for better treatments that may also be more affordable to society than current methods. The history of addiction uh, in, in, in the last few decades is put them behind the walls of a facility and spend a lot of money doing that. And although that is the right answer for some people, most of the time staying connected with their families and staying in their jobs and keeping um, out of a facility tends to be a place where they get to practice using skills that need to be developed. Um, how it came about that people go into a facility for four weeks or six weeks and then come out with this fixed addiction. Um, that's not how the human brain works. It is a journey that you can really put some tight bumper cars on their life to say, let's help you get in the right direction. And then over the course of six months, which is how long our treatment program lasts, uh, to really then have less and less and less of those guardrails. I actually think addiction is, uh, whatever they're addicted to is really the symptom um, when I am going through their history, I approach addiction to uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, uh, all in a very similar manner. They're using it as a self-soothing, a way to feel better, and whether that's food or alcohol or opiates or sex, that addiction is a comfort model that they've practiced and used uh, that is now being abused. They are not using a balanced approach to soothe and comfort their anxieties and stress. And all the Prozac in the world doesn't help that outcome unless you address that this is an addictive, abusive model of, of self-soothing. And that's the same process that happens in other forms of addiction where it becomes this practice skill. Uh, naltrexone blunts that uh, uh, abundance of uh, spiked dopamine and um, when they would, the first trial was done in uh, oral naltrexone in the 70s. And when they did this with the bulimia, 100% uh, uh, remission. Did not have a problem as long as they were on the naltrexone. And then if they did that long enough to change the behavior, they did not return to the bulimia. That the shot is so expensive that it has been a barrier to use. Uh, and, but there's been a couple of great social experiments in the country. You had Missouri, who went to their state senate and said, after the second DUI, we want to make this one of the you know, choice points of either go to jail for your second DUI or go to this medical clinic, which was very, very much uh, using this option. And they decreased the cost of their uh, DUI by the a cost of the shot within six months. So unlike what happens with most addiction programs or most DUI or most uh, you know, deterrent programs, you might get your cost returned back over the next three, four, five, six years. This was within six months, they not only returned the cost of what the shot had done because it really did lower that, recidiv you know, that relapse rate. So that uh, brings us to the question of naltrexone. Uh, I, I, uh, she really thinks that it helps in many cases. Have you had uh, 
experience using it. Yeah, I mean, naltrexone is not a new drug, um, and it is delivered in ways other than a long-term injectable, which is where Dr. Bosworth was talking about the cost. There's several studies looking at naltrexone in a number of different uh, disorders. Understand that what it blocks is um, opioid uh, receptors. So the way it primarily works is through extinguishing, if you look at classical behavior. So it isn't something that's going to work right away if you are addicted to anything. Um, other, other than it is mixed with um, buprenorphine and some other things when you're looking at trying to treat opioid addiction. But the concept in things like alcohol addiction is that if you use naltrexone, um, you don't get the positive reinforcing experience when you utilize. So the studies, when you're drinking. You right, you drink and wild. you don't get the same feeling. It's like, well, what the heck am I doing this for? I'm just getting bloated and tired and I don't feel good. So the studies that look at naltrexone show that over time it is effective and only, the studies uh, have the caveat, only effective if you are also involved in treatment. So naltrexone has a role in several types of addictions. Um, there are probably the most powerful studies in terms of the alcohol addiction is combining naltrexone um, with an NMDA uh, glutamate uh, kind Which of rebalancing drug. Of course, now that you asked me that, it flees right <laughs> out of my head. Yeah. It's uh, but a, not a common drug. Well, it's it's specifically designed to treat addictions, so it will come to me as soon as we switch to another subject. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> well, the other thing is the aversive. Uh, you know, the, you've heard of anabuse or disul yeah. disulfiram, and that basically makes you feel sick when you drink when alcohol. When you drink, so it helps you. But you, you definitely don't want to use that in a vacuum. Any of these medicines are only partially. You have to still be involved in that treatment program and be motivated to change. Yeah. So you can't just go give your you know, yeah. your loved one, some of this medicine, expecting Sneak to quit drinking. In. Yeah, you know, it's not going to work that I way. I think all providers are cautious, I'm sure Dr. Bosworth is too, to, to try to identify with folks that, you know, there is not a drug available that is the solution. No. It, any recovery from an addiction requires a lot of support and a highly motivated individual. And, you know, for example, in Teen Challenge, they they have leaned on religion as an important component of it. Uh, and, and my sense is, that's a very helpful part because it, it gives them back some part of their brain that is unused uh, prior to this. Or do you have any opinions about that quickly? Well, I, I just think there's no one size fits all treatment. I mean, if you have somebody who's, you know, believes in you know, a Christian faith, it can be very helpful. If you have someone who's a traditional Native American, you may want to lean towards some Native Americans uh, or, you know, structured program. So I think you got to take each person individually. There's no one size fits all. Another concept, I think, uh, you know, the idea that four weeks or two weeks or anything is going to make a substantive change is, is just flat out wrong. And I agree with Dr. Bosworth. Four weeks was an arbitrary number. I, ha I have no idea where that came from. Maybe there's some ob obscure okay. study somewhere. Really, you need to be followed through over a year and longer, and that's why that's one of AA's benefits. I mean, you yeah. are immersed in a community that continues to work with you and help you in right. your recovery. The Teen Challenge is 16 months, or 15, 13, 14, 15 months. Quickly, amitriptyline for sleep, what do you think? I think it's a decent jo uh, option. It's, it's uh, not benzo. Tricyclic, use it carefully, don't overdose on it, but it has right. a lot of positives. That's right. Um, we'll be back right after this. You do we haven't to save your child's life. Secondhand smoke can kill them any number of ways. So would you stop smoking around them? Would you ask your family and friends not to smoke around them? Would you keep them away from places where people smoke? Of course you would, because you can choose. They can't. It takes courage to stand up for your child. But if you don't, who will? Trouble, trouble, trouble. Oh, we've got trouble right here in River City with a capital T that rhymes with P and that stands for prescription drugs. Proof of this trouble comes from South Dakota's new prescription drug monitoring program, PDMP, established by the South Dakota legislature in 2010. This tool is there to help prescribers and pharmacies know when a drug seeker is at the door falsely claiming a medical problem in order to obtain drugs to sell or abuse. We know that in South Dakota, 162 people have obtained separate prescriptions for narcotics from more than 10 physicians over only eight, this last eight months. And 55 have tapped at least six prescribers for such meds using six or more different pharmacies. 
We also know that since 2004, poisoning deaths in South Dakota from abuse or wrongful use of certain prescription drugs have averaged at 19 deaths per year, mostly due to narcotics and opioids, and that number appears to be on the rise. Still, appropriate prescribing of narcotic pain relieving medications provides for many an escape from suffering. Rest assured that physicians and care providers will and should prescribe pain relievers without hesitation when such medicines are needed to help people in trouble. But with all that compassionate care comes excessive prescribing. In fact, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program tells us that in the first eight months of this year in South Dakota, there have been dispensed more than 11 million tabs of the specific medication hydrocodone with acetaminophen, or Vicodin. That is 13 tabs for every South Dakotan. Other prescriptions for potentially abused medications commonly sold on the streets include Zolpidem, or Ambien, Lorazepam, or Ativan, Methylphenidate, or Ritalin, Concerta, and Oxycodone with acetaminophen, or Percocet, to name a few. Not saying they're always wrong and badly used, but they can be and are. The harms from drug abuse extend beyond the illicit user to those living nearby. The surrounding community so exposed has increased crime and violence, child and spouse abuse, motor vehicle accidents, sexually spread diseases, fetal malformations in children, and deaths due to accidental or intentional overdose. We got trouble, trouble, trouble right here in South Dakota. This is a call to all physicians and pharmacies out there who are targeted by drug seekers. Do not fall for it. Use the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program to be aware of the danger to patients and society. And just say no when, when you should. And to those who are seeking illicit drugs, know that we are watching you. Brain is the devil's playground. Trouble, oh, right here in River City, right here in City. where the capital T and that rhymes with P and that stands for pool. Stands for pool. We've surely got trouble, surely got trouble. Right, here right, here. right here in River City. Got to figure out a way to keep the young ones moral after school. Our children, children, gonna have trouble. We got to keep those kids moral after school. <laughs> <laughs> I think they need a band. That's what we need. We need a think method of band. So, well, well, tell us. No, I, you touched on it. It's the most rapidly expanding uh, substance of abuse. Narcotics. Not just in South Dakota, uh, across the nation. It accounts for uh, more ER visits and more um, inadvertent deaths or in unintended deaths than any drug out there problem. right now. It's so a huge problem. it is. And, you know, I think there's a lot of factors. As physicians, there was a lot of push to treat pain more aggressively. They've called it the fifth vital sign. So, yeah. you know, again, it, it's maybe. Um, a look in, inside our system at sometimes the law of unintended consequences. Yeah. We've got a minute and a half. David, your comments about narcotics. Well, you, we're seeing it in adolescence too. It's, uh, it's grown beyond just, you know, it used to be like in the point zero percentiles. Now we're seeing one to three percent of um, high school students using narcotics. And I think there's a, there's a, a perception again that it's safe because it's a prescription drug and it, you know, that couldn't be any you know, further from the truth. No. And, and they're sold on the street. I mean, they're available. I mean, apparently. Well, one of the things that's become evident now that we have this tool to track yeah. prescriptions is that people that are oftentimes legitimately using their pain meds are also getting another script or two to sell on the side to supplement their income uh, because they are a highly marketable uh, prescription drug. Yeah. They're a valuable commodity on the streets. Yeah. Um, 30 seconds, final words. Just, I, I, again, I want to just harp on prevention. I really think we need to look at um, targeting, you know, community-based, individual-based, you know, looking at the factors that lead to adolescent uh, drug use. And if we can start early, I think we can make a big difference. Matt? I think there's an increasing focus on how we treat substance abuse. I would agree with Dr. Ermer. Prevention is a huge area where we're going to improve. But the medications, you know, looking at forms of treatment that may be more effective and less costly, um, we're entering a new era. I just want to encourage people to stay tuned. And if you have somebody with addictions, Encourage them to get help. Get some help. 
This brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our studio guests and friends, Dr. Stanley and Dr. Ermer, for helping us answer all of those insightful questions from our audience. One of the BG brothers, Maurice Gibb, said it well, the most important thing about recovery is to pass the message on. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. for on-call television is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Dermatology, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, the Orthopedic Institute, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.